the global southern oceans provide hope ahead. I am Mark Sponsor, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, August 11th. Storm Surf. Waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. If you like the video, give us a thumbs up. If you have a question, write it up in the comments section down below. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe by clicking the Storm Surf icon down in the lower right hand corner of your screen. That'll get you set up for automatic notifications for when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. And if you'd like to make a small contribution to the cause, you may. Hit the super thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. And with that, I'd like to thank the folks that donated last week. There is a good batch of all of you donating. I appreciate it. So Tim Caston, Evolution Moto, our two longtime contributors. Thank you, guys. Peter Carpenter, Carmelo Buscemi. Uh, Carmelo, you've been donated a bit lately. Thank you so much. MXB and East Slate. East Slate, known for quite a few years. Uh, thank you. And then Mark Herlock. And then a major contributor, Slade Fester, completely over the top. Thank you so much, Slade. I do really appreciate it. And honestly, I appreciate the donations from everyone. And with that, let's get to work. We'll start by looking at the current state of the seas across the planet. Not only the Pacific, but also the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic. In the Pacific, we have a gale with looks like 40-foot seas targeting mainly Patagonia and I'm sure some sideband energy up into Chile, but certainly nothing aimed at the U.S. West Coast. A quieter pattern in the South Atlantic for the moment, though there is a gale pushing under the southern tip of Africa, providing hope beyond. And there is yet another gale that previously pushed under the southern tip of Africa with just about barely 30-foot seas moving into the Indian Ocean, providing hope beyond there as well, and a more active pattern is suggested. But before we get into all that, we're going to take a look at current conditions along our home breaks here in California and Hawaii. We're looking at the buoys, and we're looking at the first buoy up here, Point Reyes buoy, 029, in Northern California. Good proxy for what's coming out of the north for the San Francisco area, down into Santa Cruz. Um, we're looking at all the energy that's hitting this buoy all the way up from 33.3 second period energy, which there is none, the whole way down to five second period. This would be pure wind chop. And this is the height of the energy in feet in each of those period bands. You can see most of the energy, 1.8, 1.9 feet, all clustered here in about the seven second period range. So with that, we look this uh, calculation here provides or tries to tease out the primary and secondary swells. Primary swell, 4.8 feet at 6.4 seconds from 324 degrees. That would make surf theoretically at three feet. It isn't even that big, honestly. It's eh, thigh high, <laughs> maybe waist high if you pushed it at low tide at the right breaks, uh, you know, perfect timing. And then whatever the secondary swell is really doesn't exist. It's more just residual kind of energy. Then we go to uh, Southern California, the Point Loma South buoy uh, off of San Diego, a good proxy for exposed breaks in Southern California. Same profile, but only less of it. A little drop of energy here at 16.7 16 seconds, not even a half a foot. And then a little bit of the wind swell trying to creep in, but mainly blocked by the Channel Islands. Primary swell 1.9 feet at 8.5 seconds from 227 degrees. Uh, that's one and a half foot surf. And then that secondary swell, 0. 0.6 feet at 16.2 seconds from 208 degrees. That's one foot. I mean, there were waves that were waist high, maybe chest high at top spots this morning in Southern California, but really nothing a whole lot better. Then we go to Lanai, the south shore of Lanai, buoy number 239. Now, this is the kind of surprise thing here. There is this bump of energy at 13 to 14 seconds. Didn't really expect this to happen, but it did. And that's a good thing if you live in Hawaii. You can see right there, uh, primary swell, two and a half feet at 13.4 seconds from 186 degrees. That's surf at 3.3 feet. So we'll say waist to chest high. That's about what it is. And that was about it. 
So let's do a quick examination of where that swell came from that's hitting Hawaii. So we're back to Friday, August 2nd in the morning. Little gale here with 20-foot seas right there, 20.9 feet. These are the highest seas over this entire domain. They happen to be right there. And if 20 feet is your highest seas in summer in the southern hemi oceans, that's not saying a whole lot for the Pacific. But anyway, this system developed a little bit more, maybe got... 23 foot seas later in the day continuing up into almost saturday morning before it faded out this is the gale that made that little pulse i said uh, you know 20 foot seas typically or 23 foot seas get you like maybe 14 second period swell if they're over a large enough area and it did and that's the swell that irradiated north and i can't believe it actually made it to Hawaii. i didn't think it, i didn't even think it would make it that far it would just d decay away into nothing but if you're on the south shore of the Hawaiian islands you have surf so that's better than where <laughs> what the rest of us are getting anyway then we moved into later in the week another gale this right here developed on monday evening we'll actually go back just one little bit there started with oh, about 29 foot seas built to 31 feet and then just lifted north from there swell from that is radiating north bound into california maybe midweek then i'm going back here again also on monday august 5th a gale developed under new zealand with 36 foot seas did it build any more than that no 36 feet but notice its track was southeast we don't expect any swell to radiate north or in any direction maybe uh into something into peru and chile but not into hawaii and not into california you know once you get when you're talking swell having to radiate 90 degrees past the fetch, forget it. 30 degrees is probably the best, or 25 to 30 off the d direction the storm is heading is about where you, the most you'll get of any meaningful uh, uh, size. And then we continue on into, well, here we are, Thursday. Another gale developed with 40-foot seas. Did it get any higher than that? Up to 42 feet, which was we thought pretty big and pretty high, but if you examine the altimetry data from the Jason 3 satellite for the South Central Pacific, here we go. And this is the, uh, these are the satellite's path. It beams a, a beam of radar down, bounces off the ocean surface. Depending on the time lag of when that uh, beam returns to the satellite, you can tell within a couple of centimeters how high the ocean, the sea heights are in where the, the satellite track is going. If you look right here, you can see 42, 48, 44, 37 foot seas, and that's not even right in the core of the storm. But we have it here, the max average measurement. This is a 15 reading average. And again, these are, you know, like every... I don't know, 200 yards, maybe something like that. But 15 of them, average reading 47.7 feet with a single reading at 52 feet here. And that was on uh, 17Z on the 8th. So that puts us back here. So this 42 feet was really more like 48 feet. Now, the real issue is how much of that swell, again, is going to radiate north? Well, let's just go see if we can do the storm track thing here, the gale formed pretty much riding right along the 60 south latitude line, pushing east into Thursday night and Friday, not really lifting north at all, with then 28, 27 foot seas, we'll say, into early Saturday. Some sideband swell is probably radiating north. The wave model underestimated the... Uh, the sea heights expected from this thing so we'll see if anything is going to show up if it does with a 48 foot sea height you could probably get a 25 23 to 25 second period swell out of that so maybe as early as oh uh, later this work week if you see something on the buoys you know that, that spectral animation out, out somewhere in the uh, 20 plus second range but maybe six inches that's where it's coming from and it probably won't get big but who knows maybe the models have completely blown it but experience suggests again you're talking 90 or maybe an 80 degree uh, 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 off axis angle heading up to california and hawaii i'd say odds are really low of anything meaningful coming from it 
and then this other system developed here but falling south targeting there we go 40 41 foot seas again building to 45 feet and let's see where we are and 43 feet but again it's doing that southeast kind of motion i'd say somewhere from about somewhere up here in peru to chile is about the only place notice let's say if you're going this way 30 degrees off axis is something like that so uh pretty much uh south america is the only target for that system then we play the same game for the South Atlantic. We're Sunday last week, August 4th. We'll just roll through this. Now notice a whole series of swells or energy storms, gales push under the South Africa. And this here 40 foot on, uh, this was Monday night into Tuesday. Now all that is well past even South Africa. We're on Friday here, the 9th of August. Well, the last system pushed under here with 35 foot seas and then let's see let's get us right to current i mean just a non-stop festering swell producing machine all very local but still certainly that's where the oops that's where the activity is that's where you are as of current so a uh, lot of energy for we'll say up into uh, west africa uh, and then up the east side as well then finally, the Indian Ocean. So here we are, we're back out there a week ago. Here's Africa again over here. We had this one little system that reorganized here on Monday, another system here. But, I mean, 30-foot seas are pretty pedestrian for the winter in the southern hemisphere. You know, just barely what I would say enough to even go, oh, there's something there. But then we got another system tried to organize 29-foot seas on Thursday building to 32 feet on Friday, August 9th, fading out. Then here's the next system pushing under Africa towards the, I'll call it the Southwest Indian Ocean, and that's our current situation. All right, so let's dive into the Pacific a little bit. We're going to start looking at the forecast, what's to come. We're going to start with the jet stream, jet stream level winds. This is a depictation of those winds. Jet stream level winds are up about 30,000 feet. And what we're looking for is a trough because a trough will help to form a counterclockwise flow like right here. This is a trough. And oh, there is New Zealand there, Australia over there, uh, Chile and Peru over here. Um, what that the jet stream will do is when it pushes to the north and then falls south, it'll create a counter a clockwise circulation. That's the hallmark of low pressure. It'll also do it down at the ocean surface, and that'll help spin up a gale. Of course, gales produce wind. Wind uh, gets traction on the ocean surface, imparts energy to the ocean, then creates seas. As those seas radiate away from the fetch area, the lesser period elements decay off, exposing swell. And of course, swell, when it hits your beach, produces surf. The jet stream is where it all starts, and the jet stream, one, helps support the formation of those gales, and two, helps direct their track. So as of Sunday, we have what looks like a potential trough developing here just along the coast of New Zealand. Not super strong winds, but that, that pushes up along the coast into Monday and then fades out. But all hope is not lost. As we get into, we just go out here a little bit further, get something that almost looks like a trough starting Saturday. And then here we go. We're almost a week out now, Sunday. Here comes another solid trough with 20, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 130 knot winds pushing to the north, building almost to 140 knots, and continuing into, whoops, that was Monday. So right there. So this is looks to be more kind of traditionally what we would expect for this summer, the prime window being the area under New Zealand. Notice a ridge building over the southeast Pacific, just totally supporting Get the split jet stream flow there, high pressure in control. So all the focus really becomes back on the Southwest Pacific, where it was earlier and pretty much the entire season. So let's go look at the effect of the jet stream, what it actually is forecast to do down at the ocean surface. So 
We have right now 30 to 35 knot winds falling south, but we have a little bit of fetch, not meaningful, 25 to 30 knots developing along the coast of New Zealand. And we also have this other gale with 45 knot winds, but they're all, you see it right here, aimed southeast, not even aimed north at all. So really no hope there. Here is this fetch of 35 knot winds building to 40 knots building not quite to 45 knots, maybe one pixel in there, but 40 knots Monday into Tuesday, lifting well to the north. This looks definitely possible for producing, again, some of that, you know, maybe 15 or maybe even 16 period swell from a good angle, unobstructed for Hawaii and possibly the U.S. West Coast, but it'll be really small since it's such a far away and not a particularly strong storm. Then things sort of meander around. You notice Fetch trying to organize here Thursday night, the 15th of August into Friday, but that only serves to rough, rough up the ocean surface. On Saturday, a legitimate gale tries to organize with 40 five knot winds aimed off to the northeast and then building to 50 knots on Saturday night lifting well to the northeast and then yet another broad system sets up right behind that in the same area the models teasing like mad hence the uh the caption to lead off this video. We'll see what materializes, but just looking at this this looks a heck of a lot better than anything we've had for the past 3 weeks. So what's the effect of those winds on the ocean surface? Well, we know there's something here developing on Monday night, the 12th of August. Here we go, 20, what was that? 20, 22, 24, barely 26 foot sea. There's your 26, almost 28 foot seas uh, late Monday night. And then mainly 26 to 27 foot seas, all again, way off to the north and, and right up there along New Zealand. So very southwest angled swell likely for Hawaii and maybe something for the U.S. West Coast getting around the Tahiti swell shadow. Then things quiet down for a little bit. You see you know, no even mid 20 foot seas till we get into Saturday night again, a week out. But there's a tiny area of 28 foot seas building to 34 feet, and those fade again. That's more of a primer gale. Oops, and then here we are a week out. All we get is 28 foot seas, but you get the sense, given the amount of wind that's supposed to be over here, that something a bit bigger will be coming if the models are not just completely teasing us. Let's go look at the South Atlantic real quick. So right now, things relative to Africa are settling down a little bit, but you get over here again in the far southwest Atlantic, and here comes another system firing up with 33-foot seas lifting well off to the northeast. Another system just building due south of Africa with 35-foot seas just raking up the southeast coast there and then building strong after that relative to the Indian Ocean. Another broad system as we get into Thursday the 15th setting up not huge seas all in the 29-foot range, but all that targeting Western Africa and then let's see if it spins up any. Nope, doesn't, as it, it pushes under South Africa. And then the Indian Ocean, of course. All right, here we go. We're starting Sunday, current, real time right now. Things kind of mellow, but a little gale builds with 36 foot seas as we get into Tuesday night. Uh, th building to 39 feet as we get into Wednesday morning. Not over a huge area, but all this targeting, you know, uh, uh, Mentawi Islands, Bali, Indonesia, Western uh, Australia. And then another system building right behind that, pushing under uh, Africa into the Indian Ocean, but weakening, and then things settle down from there. Surf spot forecast. Santa Cruz, things pretty mellow at the moment. You can see surf... Just for the, for the next week, again, holding in this like two foot range, barely rideable, if even that, good for a soft top or maybe a long board. Wind's not too bad coming up in the afternoon, but nothing special. That said, right in here, the models aren't showing it, at least not this one, but you can sort of tease it out here. That swell from the far south uh, Pacific that's pushing north should be dribbling in like a late Tuesday into Wednesday sort of thing. You know, nothing big, but something rideable. 
But if you go look at Southern California, we're looking at Dana Point here, you can see the swell certainly showing up better in the two and a half to three foot range. And this is Tuesday into Wednesday, fading out on Thursday. We'll go look at swell sizes. And here you go, two feet, 16 seconds, 1.8 at 15 and a half, something like that. And it'll actually be probably a little bit higher than that. And again, that's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then you see as we get into Sunday, a little tiny bit of energy building on the far end of the forecast there from yet one of the other gales that was south of us. Oahu, now nothing's really aimed at uh, Oahu, at least not immediately with surf heights one and a half to maybe two feet. Let's go look at the actual, well, here's the last little bit of that swell that was under New Zealand, one and a half feet. Well, that's Sunday, so let's get into Monday. 1.4 feet at 12 seconds, something like that. Not really a whole lot. Little bits of background energy, one and a half feet at 12 seconds. But then you see swell starting to arrive as we get into Sunday in earnest, building to 1.4 feet at 17 seconds. Now, just for contrast, Jeffreys Bay along the southeast coast of Africa, this is surf heights, 25 feet, dipping down to only 10 feet, then up to 40 feet. I mean, that's, it's not going to be 40 foot Jeffreys Bay, but because the, where this is actually located is a bit off the coast there. And given the contour of the coast and the direction of the storms, it's sort of raking sideways up the coast. But if you're a couple hundred miles off the coast, you could experience some big seas. And But also notice wind speeds here, 40, 45 knots out of the uh, west, southwest. Probably don't want to be anywhere out in a boat in this would be the Wednesday time frame. And then things settling down nicely into just the, uh, oh, 12 foot range, maybe up to 20 feet. Let's look at swell sizes here. Uh, swell height, 20 feet at 13 seconds. This is probably right now as we're talking. The big one, 32 feet at 14 to 15 seconds sort of thing. And just continue to pulse in there 10 feet, 12 feet at 15 to 16 seconds. So uh, no lack of swell. And then you look at this and you look at the wind speeds and they're all relatively light once you get over this big hump on midweek. And then finally, Bali, just a good representative sample of what's happening, you know, for the Indian Ocean. Uh, surf heights building to 12 feet, uh, fading to 10 to 8 feet. Oh, finally down to 6 feet, and then it goes right back up again. Swell sizes, 7.8 feet at 16 seconds. That's a really nice swell. Fading to the five and a half foot range at 12 seconds and then going right back up to nine at 16 as we get into next weekend. So again, no lack of a swell there. What the Pacific Ocean is not producing, it's making up for in spades in the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. And then finally, the backpackers temperature forecast is the weird looking chart if you're not used to it. This is uh, focused on the intersection of Tioga Pass Road going through with the high country of Yosemite and the Pacific Crest Trail up there at about 8,700 feet. That's this line right here. So this is the temperature profile. If you're up at 13,000 feet, you can see uh, you could theoretically have the red line is the freeze line. So maybe freezing temperatures. But if you're down where most people would be hiking, probably in the nine to 10,000 foot range. We'll do that at 87, but uh, 8,700, but temperatures here, oh, 50 to 55 degrees, maybe building to 60 degrees during the day, then maybe warming up a little bit as we get, and basically holding like that the whole way into next weekend. Then by Sunday, temperatures coming up a little bit, 60 to 65 degrees, with six, the 65 degree line solidly reaching up to the 8,700 foot point after that. You can see down low temperatures definitely building like in the Central Valley. Don't want to be there. All right, let's take a look long term. We're going to look at the two major oscillations that affect weather both in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, and specifically the production of storms in the oceans, be it Indian Ocean, Atlantic, or Pacific. Uh, the major oscillations, the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, and of course, ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. 
We start by looking for signs of the MJO, specifically the active phase of the MJO. There are two phases, the active and inactive. The active one is our friend. It supports storm formation. The inactive phase suppresses storm formation. The active phase is effectively a low pressure system. The MJO travels west to east on the equator. The active phase on one side of the planet, inactive phase on the other. They rotate around the planet like that, opposite of one another. When the active phase moves over the Pacific or the Indian Ocean or whatever for that matter, it helps support storm formation by taking warm moist air at the ocean surface lifting it aloft. It's a low pressure system, so it acts like a chimney. Lifts warm, moist air aloft. That gets caught by the jet stream, energizes the jet stream, both North and South Pacific or Indian Ocean or wherever, and then helps create uh, troughs, which help form low pressure systems, which help produce surf. So the active phase is our friend. The inactive phase is a high pressure system. It effectively shuts off the chimney effect and then steals energy from the jet stream and doesn't support storm formation. So wherever the active phase is, as it rotates around the planet and it moves from west east, so from the Indian Ocean over the Pacific, over the Atlantic Ocean and then back around the planet. So there's the up phase where you get a lot of storm production and surf and then the down phase. Now, the other thing that interacts with all that is El Nino and La Nina. So if you have the active phase of the MJO moving over an area uh, where there is El Nino, the two of them sort of sync up and supercharge each other, and then you get a lot of surf production. And that is kind of what's happening under Africa right now, is the low pressure bias merging up with active phases of the MJO. It's like El Nino in the southern hemisphere winter over there whereas last winter we had el nino in the pacific low pressure bias active phases of the mjo not doing as much as we would have liked but again it's that partnership between these two phases when they sync up you get a lot going on all right all that said what's this chart all about here we're looking for active signs of the active phase of the mjo right the uh, active phase of the MJO, it's like a low pressure system. Low pressure dampens trade winds because trade winds are created by high pressure. Okay, the inactive phase increases trade winds. So we can just look at this. This is data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator. That's the equator right there. That is New Guinea there. This is the far east Pacific. The arrows are just a graphic representation of wind speeds. Five-day average winds, are they stronger or weaker than normal? Again, the active phase of the MJO suppresses trades. If we saw that, then we'd see less strong arrows, like kind of what we're seeing there. So in the East Pacific, we see long arrows, so strong trades here, pretty much strong trades approaching the date line, but a little bit weaker over here in the West Pacific. But it is not the actual wind speed, it's the anomaly, the difference from normal for this time of year. In the East Pacific, trades are, you see the arrow there, a little bit stronger than normal, but not too much. Pretty much neutral over the date line, and maybe, if anything, a little bit westerly angled here. So maybe some signs of a weak active phase in the West Pacific? Maybe. Let's go look at the forecast. Oh, and remember, these are five-day average winds. So what's happening today... That what's represented here on the chart is kind of what was maybe happening three days ago. So let's go look at the forecast now. 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies, what has actually happened, and the forecast. Here is today's date or when the model was last run, August 11th. All right, now this is for the whole planet. So the date line, 180 is right up the middle. So that's in the sort of the West Pacific. All right, the Pacific starts at 125 east. So right about there, and the date line's there. And the main area where all these winds really affect the jet stream and do most for storm production in the Pacific is between here and about here, all right? So the blues are easterly anomalies. Just consider that sort of the inactive phase of the MJO. The yellows and then the oranges, westerly anomalies, the active phase of the MJO. So it looks like back in July... And August, we had a weak active phase of the MJO, but it mainly only affected the East Pacific here. 
and not so much over the dateline because you see easterly anomalies persisted. Looking at the forecast looking forward, it just looks like a major easterly wind burst is forecast. This is not good. This is the exact opposite of a, uh, you know, uh, an El Nino. This is like a classic La Nina easterly wind burst sort of thing. And forecast holding for the next two weeks completely. Where our westerly anomalies are all sequestered in the area under Africa here and into the Indian Ocean. So again, now this doesn't mean that we're not going to have storms in the Pacific, but what it does suggest is that these those storms will be smaller than normal. They won't last as long. They won't be lo as large in aerial coverage, and they probably won't even be as strong. So not a great time for storm production in the Pacific, according to this chart, but let's keep digging. Next up, outgoing long wave radiation forecast, just fancy words for cloud cover. If the active phase is a low pressure system, then it takes warm moist air, lifting it aloft. That warm moist air eventually has to hit cold air in the upper atmosphere, condenses, creates more clouds than normal. This chart depicts that. Oh, South America, Central America, New Guinea there, EQ is the equator, dateline right there, 180 west, and this goes today five days from now, 10 days, 15 days from now. This is a statistic model, but the yellows suggest more sunlight bouncing off the ocean surface, meaning less clouds, meaning the inactive phase of the MJO. This sort of suggests the active phase is somewhere over here, probably trying to work its way into the Atlantic, maybe. Remember, we had a hurricane and tropical storm and stuff over in this region just, what, the past week, okay? My guess is as the active phase pushes east, that'll all shut down. So here we go, five days from now. Uh, dry air, oh, cloud-free skies are typically driven by high pressure, which is an indication of the inactive phase of the MJO. See low pressure trying to build in the Indian Ocean. Same deal, pretty much inactive phase of the MJ over the Pacific day 10, and then supposedly a dead neutral pattern two weeks from now. Now, the dynamic model, the GEFS model, suggests the inactive phase much stronger, while the active phase over in the Indian Ocean and over Africa building much stronger than what the previous model said, and the inactive phase holding longer over the Pacific. Next up, phase diagrams. The same two models, statistic model, dynamic model. This just drills in, gives us a little bit more detail. How do you read this? Well, this is the, the MJO moves from west to east, be it either active or inactive phase. But this chart shows you just the active phase, where it is, and where it's forecast to go. The active phase moves from the Indian Ocean to the Maritime Continent, to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, under the United States, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active phase is right now. So somewhere over Africa, just trying to make its way into the Indian Ocean. No surprise, South Africa getting slammed by storm after storm. Now, if the dot is on this circle or within the circle, it's considered very weak. These are the one, two, three forecast tracks, all of it having it moving to the maritime continent two weeks out. And if it's inside the circle, considered extremely weak. The dynamic model, look at this, has the active phase building to nearly moderate plus strength over the central Indian Ocean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to nine days from now, and then making it to the maritime continent two weeks from now and weakening. So to me, looking at this summer between Africa and the Indian Ocean over the next two weeks is probably the call. The upper level model, now this runs a week ahead of what happens at the surface. This is up at jet stream level. Oh, and let's get ourselves already. South America, Central America, New Guinea, zero is the equator. Dateline roughly right down the middle here. Um, the oranges, dry air, inactive phase of the MJO. The greens, wet air, the active phase of the MJO. Remember, this is a week ahead, so the reality is it's probably, the greens are probably at the surface somewhere here, and the inactive phase is somewhere over here. This shows the active phase moving through from Africa to the Indian Ocean, probably into about uh, the 28th of August, and whatever is in the Pacific, 
moving out of the Kelvin wave generation area after the end of August, inactive phase, pushing into the Atlantic as we get late into August, and then inactive uh, inactive phase taking over the, over the Pacific for the first half of September. This is the CFS model going out a month. I honestly believe trust this model more than I trust that last model. And this model also shows MJO, the black contour here. So again, this is the east-west component of the wind up at 850 millibars, about 4,700 feet up, but a good proxy for what's going on down at the ocean surface. The date line right up the middle here. The area we're interested in the Pacific from 125 east to about 170 west. This is past performance here. The dotted contours, little bits of the inactive phase of the MJO popping across the Pacific. Now here is our current active phase of the MJO, east of the dateline as of today. You see the westerly, the, the reds westerly nom anomalies associated with it. Now we look forward. Now this starts at August 7th, so this is a little bit older data, but I suspect it's still pretty much spot on. Dotted contour, inactive phase of the MJO setting up now going solid the inactive phase pushing over the date line by about August oh, 25th or 26th but notice east anomalies holding strong the whole way into September with the active phase not showing now but starting to build in the Indian Ocean and getting pretty solid with big westerly anomalies the whole way through over the maritime continent through the end of the model run. So uh, a good run, again, for everywhere but the Pacific. And then finally, the CFS model. This is past performance here, and this is the forecast up here. This goes out three months to November 7th, all right? Uh, the date line runs right up the middle. This is the east-west component of the wind. Blue is easterly anomalies. Yellow is westerly anomalies. We saw this last week, pretty much the same pattern, though not quite as positive as what we saw last week. You see, so here we go. Here is easterly anomalies from now into the end of August, pretty much the inactive phase of the MJO. Then the active phase coming end of August into early September, holding the whole way for the foreseeable future with weak westerly anomalies. The dividing line right about here and it's about 165 east, so limited to the far west Pacific. Inactive phase limited to or, uh, the easterly anomalies, mainly over the east Pacific. Let's overlay the MJO. All right, so here's our current active phase of the MJO, the solid contour. It's east of, well, California's at 120. It's east of the dateline. So it's over the East Pacific and fading out, while this one, two, three, four uh, contour inactive phase of the MJO sets up in the Pacific, likely going to produce those strong easterly anomalies that we saw on the previous chart till September 4th. Then here comes the active phase with three contours producing westerly anomalies and helping support gale form formation. Again, the south. this would probably be the Southwest Pacific, the New Zealand co corridor, again, for basically the foreseeable future. That's good if we can just get through the next one, two and a half weeks, something like that, then maybe we'll be in a better p pattern in the Pacific. That said, here, zero is, uh, you know, approach a uh, uh, the the zero meridian. So this would be Europe, and this would be just to the west side of Africa. All westerly anomalies the whole way through the Indian Ocean, barely seeping into the Pacific. The focus steadily becomes the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. We overlay the low-pass felt here. This only drives it home even more. Black contour, low pressure bias, the El Nino signal, but it's Right here, smack dab in the middle of the Indian Ocean, no big surprise. The dotted contour here, the high pressure bias, smack dab in the Pacific. The good news is here, it, it's been building since April, and it was supposed to be really strong right now, and it just is forecast dying effectively completely until we get into September. Then it comes in with one and maybe two contours, um, not a particularly strong La Nina, but not weak either, enough to sort of really hamper storm development in the Pacific long term.
All right, so let's talk a little bit more now just about the Pacific. We're talking about subsurface temperature profiles. This is the West Pacific here. This is the East Pacific here. These little things here, these X's, these are sensors on the anchor lines of the TAO buoy array. Um, notice there is a giant hole here. Also notice, I think there was more data even last week, so a whole section of this thing is just dropped out now. This is becoming less and less helpful. That said, there is a program to go upgrade all the TAO buoys over the next year, so uh, all hope is not lost, but we can glean some things out of this. This is uh, you use a model to fill in the gaps where there aren't buoys to get an idea of what's where is the warm water at. Warm water is the red, blue is cold water, and you're really interested from 150 meters up. Typically during La Nina, trades are stronger than normal. They take all the warm water, push it off into the West Pacific here. During El Nino, the exact opposite ha happens. The active phase of the MJO produces westerly anomalies, which allows all this warm water sequestered in the West Pacific to start pushing east. Today, the 20, the 30 degree isotherm is gone. The 29 degree isotherm limited from 170 and point, 170 west and points there, about where it was last week. The 28 degree isotherm at 160. It might have been 163 west last week, so no big change. 24 degrees isotherm. Hovering somewhere between 100 and 115 west, so really no change, but clearly indicating most warm water in the west, not so much in the east, but this isn't what really matters. It is the anomalies, difference from normal for this time of year. Now you see massive cold water. Here's a set of sensors running right through the middle of it. That's no big surprise. But you see this one to two degree anomalies over here in the east Pacific. Don't not really sure where that's coming from. And you see this big area of deadness right here where there's no sensors. Suspect this cold water, basically a La Nina-induced uh, uh, upwelling Kelvin wave is erupting somewhere in here. In fact, you can see it here. You can see, so this is uh, a different model, if you will, using the same TAO buoy data, but also using a satellite to help sort of fill in the gaps. You see the warm water in the west, the cold water fully working its way up to the surface from 150 west, so that's a point south of Hawaii on the equator, the whole way over to Ecuador. Yeah, there's a couple little pockets of warming here, but really this is the classic La Nina pattern. Not super strong, at least not yet, but after the coming two to three weeks of easterly anomalies just taking this warm water and shoving it even more off to the west and help fueling upwelling even more. Suspect water temperatures will drop even more. Here is the sea level anomaly data used with the uh, used in conjunction with the TAO buoy data to get you a map of the ocean heights. All right, we'll talk about this in a second. Chile. Peru, Central America, this is the equator, this is the dateline here, New Guinea here. These are not temperatures, these are the height of the ocean, 15 centimeters lower than normal, than the average sphere of where the ocean is. Why would that be? Well, if you have cold water at depth, cold water contracts. When it does, it displaces the water downward above that, okay, and that'll you get negative anomalies. Likewise, over here in New Guinea, you see zero to five centimeter anomalies. When you have warm water at depth, it expands, displaces water up above it, so you get a positive anomaly. So this is just another way to sort of get a sense of where is the cold water and where is the warm water, just five degrees north and south of the equator. That's all you really care about. And clearly, there's uh, the Galapagos Islands there, Ecuador's there. Cold water, Negative anomalies from Ecuador almost the whole way out to the dateline, again indicative of La Nina. Upper ocean heat anomalies for the Pacific, West Pacific here, East Pacific here, the oranges and red, warmer than normal waters. You can see back, this goes back a year, September, October, November, during our El Nino. Kelvin waves driven by the active phase of the MJO, produce, taking warm water, pushing it east across the Pacific. But at some point, all the warm water ran out in the Pacific, and then you end up with this upwelling pattern. And then it starts working its way across the Pacific in one downwelling Kel, Kel, or upwelling Kelvin wave 
in January and February, signaling the demise of El Nino. Another one in March, another one in April. Then there was a bit of a break, and you see warm water trying to sort of rebuild. Now here we go, another uh, uh, upwelling Kelvin wave with one, two, three, four. That's one, two, three, four. One and a half to two degree anomalies. Pretty solid one here again. And here's the dividing line about 170 west between the cold, roughly on the date line, between the cold and the warm to the west. Again, indicative of La Nina. The warm pool over here needs to recharge before we get another El Nino. For how bad things look subsurface, here we're looking at sur sea surface temperature anomalies. Things not nearly as bad, but I suspect this will be short-lived. You see uh, uh, Chile, Peru, South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea here. Here's the equator. Just that area, one, we'll say five degrees north and south of the equator. This is the equator right here. And you see cold water developing along Peru up off of Ecuador, over the Galapagos, and starting to build out here, the whole way out to almost 160 west. There's Hawaii. Not particularly huge yet, but with this coming pulse of the inactive phase of the MJO, I expect the extent and the depth of these colder temperatures will build some. You still see warmer than normal temperatures north and south, leftovers from either El Nino or just the uh, global warming uh, signature present in the Pacific. The sea surface temperature trend for the past seven days, again, here's the equator, South America, Central America. Blues, cold, cooling waters. Well, we had some hurricane activity here. You see that off of Cabo. That creates upwelling. This is all that cool subsurface pool, upwelling uh, Kelvin waves, and a little bit stronger than easterly trades having their effect here. Little patches of warming and cooling. I mean, it's not a horrible signal at all, but just the trend getting cooler the past seven days. And then, again, looking at the overall view. Cooling, not bad. Could be worse, but probably will get worse. Give it another couple of weeks. So what's the sea surface temperature trend for the Nina 1.2 region? The area right there by Ecuador and uh, the Galapagos Islands. Temperatures today, minus 0.820. So about three quarters of a degree below normal right here. And the trend has basically been hovering somewhere around one degree below normal for months now, indicative of the coming El Nino. Now, this is not the official El Nino monitoring region, but this next chart is. The Nino 3.4 area, this is the area from a point south of California at 120 west out to about the date line, 170 west. Temperatures have been hovering right around neutral May, June, into mid-July. Then you see this steady downward trend. Today's value, oh, hot, pull it out right there, point. 280, one quarter of a degree below normal. You need to be uh, half a degree below normal for months before you can declared even in La Nina. So we're not there yet, but the trend, you can see the downward trend happening. Let's dig into this data a little bit more. This is the temperature data. Here is the week. It's one week at a time in the official record. This is the Nino 3.4 region. This column right here is the actual deviation from normal. So you see we are at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, up to 0.4 degrees, but, you know, roughly hovering right at zero. Uh, this past week, the week of July 31st, temperatures dropped to a two-tenths of a degree below normal, which is statistically insignificant. Then this over here is the monthly official Nino 3.4 temperature index. So back September, October, November, and December, we were up 2.02 degrees, and then uh, indicative of El Nino. And then you see temperatures slowly fading for the month of July, officially a tenth of a degree still above normal. But you see the downward trend typical of a fading El Nino moving towards at least a neutral pattern. And then finally, the three-month running average. And 
even that isn't enough. You know, three months in a row doesn't necessarily get you El Nino or La Nina, but it's a pretty good representation of what's going on. So this would be May, June, July, August, May, June. You get the idea. The temperature official record was plus 1.49 and plus 1.47 degrees. So basically a strong moderate El Nino, not even a strong El Nino. This is all corrected for a, but for the global warming signal and a bunch of other stuff too. Okay. And right now, officially, we're down at minus three or uh, 38 hundredths of a degree below normal. So not even into weak La Nina yet. You got to be at half a degree. We're not even there yet, but suspect we're heading that way. So what does the atmosphere think is going on? This is the Southern Oscillation Index, or at least the data used to compute the Southern Oscillation Index. Is pressure lower or higher than normal in the Pacific? Remember, we looked at the previous charts. They talked about the low pressure bias. In fact, this chart here, and I'll pull out the M, I'll even I'll pull out the winds even and the MJO. The low pressure bias suggesting pressure is lowest in the Indian Ocean, and the high pressure bias here suggesting is higher over the Dateline. So this is that was a model. This is reality. The daily contribute difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, roughly in the Indian Ocean, Tahiti in, uh, in the equatorial Pacific. When pressure is lower over Tahiti, the index goes negative. So we're minus 5.40. We've been down at minus 1621. You get it. A couple of days in a row negative. This stuff really bounces around. The past couple of days before that, we were kind of neutral. Then we were negative. This was uh, back there uh, when low pressure pushed south of Tahiti, making the Olympics swell. And then you, you can kind of look at the trend there. It's been bouncing all over the place. Hard to discern a trend. But then we go to the 30-day average. So this is 30 days, sort of takes the noise out of it, minus 8.84. That's looking good. That does not suggest La Nina, at least at the moment. And looking back over the past month, we're actually, if anything, going more negative, not positive, suggesting definitely not La Nina. That said, the atmosphere says not La Nina. The ocean says La Nina. The 90-day average, minus 3.39. Where have we been the past month? Eh, we're toggling somewhere in the barely negative territory. In fact, let's go look at a graph of this. Here's the 30-day running average of the Southern Oscillation Index. Neutral, according to this. Well, there's zero right in the middle. Okay, this was back during our big La Nina. If you're positive, that means high pressure dominating the Pacific. La Nina in control until our El Nino did its thing, stalled in July, and then is steadily fading from there. But now here we are. You see it just bouncing kind of around. These are the inactive, these are the active phases of the MJO, the downward push, the upward pushes, the inactive phases. If anything, we're heading more, ne more negative than positive. But so the atmosphere is saying, well, I'm not in La Nina yet. If anything, maybe the hangover from El Nino is still affecting us a little bit. And that kind of makes sense considering that the focus of storm production has been south of Australia this entire summer or the southern hemisphere winter in the Pacific. So sort of a mixed, pa mixed bag going on here. That said, CFS uh, version 2 model forecast for sea surface temperature anomalies in the Nino 3.4 region in the Pacific, the official El Nino monitoring region, suggests temperatures. Well, let's see, we're in August somewhere, so we're, we're almost mid-August, so probably right about here. This says temperatures should be about a half degree below normal, which they aren't even there. They're more somewhere right around neutral and falling to minus 1.5 degrees. So half a degree to one degree would be a weak La Nina. One to one and a half degree would be a moderate El Nino. So this suggests a, a solid moderate El Nino. But this model kind of always overhypes it. So uh, NOAA has put together a PDF corrected version of this. And it suggests temperatures going to maybe 1.1 or 1.2 degrees below normal. This is actually a little bit of a downward revision, a little bit cooler than the past couple of weeks, but still uh, weak, moderate La Nina for this coming winter. So for right now, for California, a small 
southern hemiswell is radiating north arriving midweek after that a series of gales are forecast there was one gale with that 48 to 52 foot seas in the deep central south pacific i don't really think we're going to see anything from that but if we do that would be later in the work week um, watch the buoys. I think it'll be more of a intellectual uh, uh, observation. Does any energy radiate at 80 degrees off axis from a storm and make it 6,000 plus miles up into California? If we get one foot at uh, 18 or 19 seconds, I I'd be shocked, but we'll see. Uh, beyond that, the good news is the models like teased in the header for the video, are looking much better with activity forecast under New Zealand, typical of a uh, uh, the summer or the winter down the Southern Hemisphere after an El Nino winter in the Pacific. Um, at some point, we'll start looking in the North Pacific, but we're not really doing a whole lot of that right now. The other thing is tropical activity. Yes, there was a little bit of uh, tropical swell that hit Southern California earlier this week. Um, don't expect to see any more of that with the inactive phase of the MJO taking over the Pacific. Major uh, easterly wind event looks forecast for the next two weeks. That'll probably take some energy out of the jet stream, uh, at least in the Pacific, but at the same time, I think the Indian Ocean and Africa, if they haven't been firing already, they will fire for sure over the next two to three weeks and uh the the bearer of the brunt of of the bad part of that will be the pacific it'll just get quieter and quieter so uh we'll see if the models are believable a week from now but for right now i had my fingers uh cautiously crossed and i'm cautiously optimistic uh long term la nina though for sure building into the pacific the question is how bad will it be for the winter right now the models the other consensus models, well, it'll be yeah, it's still another 10 days till we uh, hear what the other models are saying going on, the 30 other El Nino models. But last time it updated, it was a week to modest La Nina forecast for this winter. That gives us some hope. We'll see how this all plays out. So for now, get what you can when you can and <laughs> make the most of it if you're in the Pacific. Uh, so that's it for this week. If you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. Comments, questions, always welcome. If you don't understand something, write it up down below. If you haven't subscribed, uh, click the Storm Surf icon down in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to get signed up for automatic notifications. And if you'd like to make a small contribution to the cause, you may hit the super thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. And again, I want to thank everyone that's been donating over the week. It's really, uh, I'm really floored by your generosity, and I do appreciate it. And with that, we are done for this week. We will do it again next week, same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.